No. Sure. You can start it. Yeah. All right. So, <laughs> this concept is all about how to graph roots and what they look like when you're graphing them. Now, the next concept is graph. So, 36, what we're going to learn tomorrow. It's only a one day concept. We're going to learn it is graph. Now, the the concept after that, we're going to do writing the equation from the graph, similar to what we did with quadratics okay, and the three forms. Now, we've talked already about imaginary roots, and I know that I've, you know, um, what's the word? Not preluded, but. John <laughs> would know this word, that's why. I foreshadowed, yes. Okay, thank you. Toward imaginary roots. And we talked about this, how they don't really appear in the graph, and you can't really see them. And the simple example in class the other day was when we had a graph that looked like this. We talked about if you have like a dip lower in the graph, then it comes through, then it flattens out, then it goes like that. Okay? This is a graph that is x to the fourth, but you only see one, two roots there. That's all you see. Okay? So again, this kind of a graph is when you don't have some of the roots appearing there. Well, where are they? They're imaginary. Now, the other thing we have to remember. Whenever we get imaginary roots, what do they come in? In how many at a time? Two. Two. Because it's what? Good. Plus or minus or pairs. Very good. So imaginary roots always come in pairs. You should be writing this stuff down if you don't know this already. You know it, that's fine. But if you don't remember that, okay, if I prompt you, it doesn't come to your mind, write it down. So again, the two roots that are over here, you can't really see them. Okay? They don't show up because they don't go through the graph. But we do know for this graph, let's say we said it was x to the fourth plus some other stuff. Okay, but again, the leading coefficient and the degree is what really matters. Okay, remember that. Now, all that other stuff that comes after doesn't really matter so much. It just affects the shape of the graph. But the general idea of the graph is really represented simply from the leading coefficient and the degree. And this leading coefficient is positive, so I know that my end behavior looks like this because I see even. Even, I think, parabola. Parabola looks like an upside down, or a regular U. Here we have this, or we have this, when it's even. But it's a positive leading coefficient, so I know it's this. So already my graph is at least a good estimate, okay? So tomorrow, when we continue to look at this stuff, we're going to say, all right, well, you know what? How do we graph this, and how do we use all the stuff that we've learned so far in order to make one graph, okay, in order to incorporate it? Now, that's imaginary roots, and again, we've talked about that. That's pretty much what we're going to go through today for imaginary. So you already kind of already learned this. Now, the repeated part is simply rules. You have to remember two rules. That's it. Okay? In order to remember the rules, what I'm going to do is have you actually take out your calculators and graph some stuff. I'm going to write the equation down. I'm going to ask you to graph it in your calculator. And after looking at a few of these, I want you to be able to come up with the rule yourself. Okay? So again, you're going to experiment with a few graphs I'm going to tell you about right now. And then, when we're done with that, you're going to take a look and try and draw a conclusion on your own. Some people might get it right away, some people might take longer. Okay, so the first example we're going to look at today. If you have the notes printed out, please don't spoil it for other people. I want everybody to try this on their own to get the rule. If you have them printed out, you know the answer already. Just, okay, again, try it. So the first one. Take a look at this one, please. Go it in your graphs. Go to y equals. In your calculator, go to y equals. Type that in, please. Now, when you hit graph, part of the graph might go off the graph on the top. So you might have to make your y max like 25 or something. So look at your window settings if it doesn't look right. <laughs> Again, guys, the X is above the word apps. I forget that. Above the word apps. So a lot of people, I'm, I'm sure, see it's going off the graph, right? So you might want to hit window. Everybody, if you're going off the graph, hit window and make your y max like 25 so it won't go off the graph. Again, the window settings is like giving a domain and range. So if your window, again, your window wants to look like this right now, because I know what this graph looks like. We want this to go up to at least 20 up here. It doesn't have to go to 25. 
Down below, it doesn't really matter what it goes to. We can just go to negative 5 down here. Along the x-axis, all we care about is from pretty much 5 on the positive side and negative 5 on the negative side. Those should be your in-window settings if you want a good graph of this. Okay, if you want to really uh, and capture it. Okay? So again, negative 5 to 5 for x, min and max. Negative 5 to 20 for y, min and y, max. You can leave it with the tens on the other settings, and it's fine. It works though. <laughs> Alright, can somebody come up and draw their graph on the board, please? Oh, it's always your Here's your best you can. What are we making about? Find your roots first so I know since where my roots are. Estimate where we're looking at. Hey, Usually, right. just drive it. Go over. Yeah. Yeah. About three pitches. Three pitches the way over. Yeah, like, we might have like a small one. But does he have a curve? This shit needs to accommodate that. Literally, we're just going to All right, that's perfect. Man. Very good. Here's the one. Okay. Can you <laughs> now, very good looking sketch there. Okay. What you're going to notice is several things. First of all, when we graph these, we're going to go through several ideas. We're going to look at the locations of the roots. We're going to look at the peaks and the troughs, wherever they may exist. Okay, and we're going to look at the end behavior. But again, that's all for tomorrow. What we're going to look at today is this. How many roots should I have? Three. I should have three. Why? Very good. Again, I should have three. Now, if you notice, there's only two. I can't have imaginary roots. Why can't I have imaginary roots? Okay, I understand what you're saying, but based on, Daniel, based on this, based on the fact that I see two roots here, how many imaginary roots would that give me? One. Jason, if you would give me how many? One. And what does it come in, though? In pairs. Remember, imaginary roots come in pairs. So I see I have a root here at negative 3. I have another root here at 2. Okay? I have a root at negative 3 and at 2. So where's the third root? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. Okay. You know what? We don't know what it is. We don't know, right? But we do know that these are roots. So everybody, make a table. Pick one of those roots, run it through, and get the other two roots. See what happens that way. Again, we know negative 3 is definitely a root. So go ahead, plug in negative 3. Or we know 2 is definitely a root. Go ahead and plug in 2. Get whatever the other roots are based on the table. So what do you notice? What happens? It's a repeated root. It's a repeated root. Again, negative 3 is one of my roots that I plugged in, and the other roots are both 2's. Okay, so here's the negative 3, here's the 2. How can I figure out, though, that this is the repeated one and this is not the repeated one? That's the issue I'm having right now, right? How do I know that it's not negative 3 that was repeated? Why is it 2? We can always try it. You're right. But what we want to do today is develop a rule. So you know what? Let's try another example now, okay? And based on the next example, we might be able to develop a rule. Okay, so keep this one in your mind. Let's go on to the next one. This is how people, this is how people come up with conjectures and theorems and postulates. They try different things until they find enough conclusive evidence to actually make a conclusion that is somewhat sound. Because you can say things until you try every case, though. It's not really true, right? That's where a proof comes in. So something like Pythagorean theorem. It works for every case. There's no case that Pythagorean theorem doesn't work. 
And again, in a three-dimensional world, obviously, nothing with like 12 dimensions and stuff, that could be weird. But in our world, the Pythagorean theorem always works. There are no exceptions to the rule. Okay? It is a law, really. And again, you say rule, it's really a law. Now, let's take a look at the next one. We're going to g of x equal to x to the fourth plus 4x cubed plus 3x squared minus 4x minus 4. Okay, I ask you to graph again, please. You might have to change your window settings, and please notice it. Okay, I'm not going to tell you the window settings. Try it on your own, and then in a minute I will show you the window settings that this should be. Again, try the window settings on your own first, and then we'll what they should be. And there's no one right or wrong answer, just that some answers better than others. Okay? I don't mean that in a mean way, but I mean it seriously. Some of the answers. There's several apps that could work, but some of them really do work better. Okay, anybody want to give me window settings? Window settings. From what to where? Jeremiah. Y max is 30? Yeah. Or this one? <laughs> Why max is 30? Yeah. Well, mine was already at 50, so it, it I mean, I guess you can go to 30, but nothing happens up there, right? Isn't it just like straight lines going up? Yeah. Yeah, 30 might be a little bit crazy. Why don't you? Why don't you go to like five? Yeah, I was gonna say go to five here. <laughs> Try that. You'll see a lot more on the graph, guys. A lot of you aren't. You're missing all the detail. Okay, what about the lower limit? You saw them. What do you got? Give me an estimate. Five. Okay. Deal. That works. Okay. What about the x-axis? Okay, and what's about the other side? That's fine. Why are you laughing like this? You're right. That, that's, that's, a, that's absolutely right. Okay, fives around will work for this one really well. Try it. You're going to see a lot more detail when you zoom in. If you were zoomed out and you went up to 30, you'll notice that if you go all the way up to 30, it looked like there was just a parabola on the page almost. Okay? Where? This is their field. Yeah. Oh, he's good. Is that what? That's not a good one. I didn't say it's not a good one. It was all wrong. What? Uh, yeah. All right, all right. All right, all right. <laughs> These kids. <laughs> Happy now? Whenever that happens, look at all the other creations, okay? Yo, you got like not you got a You got a B, You got a B. 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 You got a Okay, now, <laughs> raise your hand if you notice the difference when you zoomed in on 5 to 5, honestly. You see the detail on the graph? Can somebody come up and graph that for me, please? Leone? Yes. All right. Now, Leone's going to show us a quick graph of this, and you can just estimate, okay? Um, and what we're going to notice, again, like last time, is we have this shape where it just kind of touches the axis, right? Okay, the root kind of just touches the axis. Thank you, sir. Okay? So it comes down, it curves back around, it just touches the axis, and then it goes through twice more. So again, we have one, two, Three roots, which is still, like last time, one less than a degree. One less than a degree. Again, I should have four roots because of the degree, but I only see three. So, based on the last one and this one, 
We have a repeating root. Where is it, Derek? It's not imaginary. Imaginary can only go in pairs. Why is it this first one, Victoria? Victoria's pointing out this one right here, guys. This is the repeated root. Why, Victoria? Very good. If you look at the last graph, didn't it have the same exact pattern? Look at the last one. The repeated root was right here. That was the repeated root. And that repeated root was tangent to the graph. Write this down, please. We're going to use that word again. Just like in geometry, tangent to a circle. Tangent means that a curve touches a line once and then retreats. It doesn't go through the line. Whereas a secant, remember, the secant goes through the circle. So if you want to think back to geometry, there's your tangent, where it literally touches once. And this is your secant, where it clearly touches more than once. So you say tangent, um, it touches at the time once, and then that's the repeated one. So when you see a tangent on the graph, whenever you see a tangent to an x-axis, ever, you have a repeated root. Okay? And notice, how many times did it appear? Did it appear twice? And in this one, if you do this, actually, you'll see that one of your roots is right here at 1, this one is at negative 1, and these two are both at negative 2. So your four roots are 1, negative 1, negative 2, and negative 2. Now, again, we have a tangent, which indicates that we have a repeated root. Okay, we have a repeated root. Now, the problem is this. I only see a repeated root twice because I see negative 2 and I see negative 2 and I see the tangent. But in a minute we're going to see that this changes when I don't have two of them repeated, but if I have three of them repeated. Okay? That's the hard part. Now, the cool part is this though. You can globalize or generalize this statement. Whenever you see a tangent, you have an even amount of repeated roots. And I know you can't see that from this example, but you have an even amount of repeated roots. For example, for example, if you had a list of roots and the roots of an equation were 2, 7, 1, 1, 1, 1. How many ones do you guys see? Four. Four. There will be a tangent because there are an even amount of them. Again, there are four repeated roots. Thus, we have a tangent. Again, whenever it's an even, whenever it's an even amount of repeated roots, you have a tangent. There were two of them here, repeated, we had a tangent. There were four of them here, you would have a tangent. So the general rule that we're developing today is that if you have a tangent on the graph, you have an even amount of repeated roots. So how do you know You don't by looking at the graph. That's the yeah. thing. All you do know is by looking at the equation. Because look at our equation. We only had four roots, right? And take a look. One, two are done already. So this could only be two roots here. This could not be four roots here. Again, because if this were four roots, you wouldn't have anything else going on here, right? These other roots would not exist. Again, you have one, two, three, four. Okay? You can't have four roots at that same point there. But if I drew this graph, let's go through an example. If I drew any random graph and I told you the degree was six, meaning there will be how many roots? Six, six roots. If you had something like this, Okay? And it says the degree is 6. You have several options here. Who can tell me what are your options? What kind of roots can I have? This is where you have to really start thinking here, guys. I know it's tough. Okay, first option is having six repeated roots. Sure, I agree. At that location right here. There's all six of your roots and they're all repeated, thus tangent. Other option? Four repeated roots and two imaginary. Four repeated, very good. And two imaginary. Somebody else for the last example. <laughs> Not all imaginary, be careful. Yeah. <laughs> Two repeated roots and four imaginary. Why can't I have all imaginary? The graph would have to be what? The graph would have to be floating. It couldn't have any intersection. Again, this tangent here alone tells me that I cannot have I cannot have all imaginary roots. All imaginary, it has to float above the graph or float below the graph. So, if all six roots were imaginary, it might look something like this. Okay? Because it doesn't touch the axis at all. All six are imaginary. Again, 
you have three options. If you understand this, it means you're really getting this concept here, okay? okay. Again, you could have six repeated, all of them being here. Because again, tangent indicates you have an even amount of repeated. Or you could have four repeated. Well, if you only have four repeated, where are the other two? They're imaginary. Or you could have two repeated, where are the other four? Those are imaginary. Again, I can't have zero repeated because it shows up on the graph. So clearly I have at least, at least two repeated there. Okay? That is even. That is even. So we've done imaginary and we've done even. Let's go to our next example. On your calculator, please graph the following. Please graph the following. And please zoom in. Zoom in a lot so you can see what's going on near the root. Again, zoom in near the root, please. There's a lot going on near the root. You have to zoom in to see it. And you can even use the zoom in function. Stop singing. You guys are terrible. Just do an eye. Can I get window settings from somebody? Window settings. I heard 5555. Five, 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 five. That works. You can even go as slow as 3333. If you zoom into 3333, that works also. It might be a little better. If the fives work also, again, you just want to be zoomed in. When I did it, I just used threes. But again, it doesn't make a difference. Okay, who can come up and sketch this one, please? It's a tough one to draw. Come on down. That's actually not Bob Barker. He doesn't say, come on down. The other guy does. Oh! Yeah, he oh. <laughs> Although I forgot his name, it would have been better than this. Sorry. That's why I sold this. Oh! Yeah, that's going to be the recording, too. Ooh, he's doing it. What's going on? Ooh, you're screwed. And then, ooh, they can do one Use the green effects when you get this. He's not missing one of his numbers. What is the point? The troll song. Oh. How's it go? How's it going? No. All right. By the end of the day, Jason's gonna be dead. I'm doing real good. Yeah. He looks really Take a guess at what's going on in your paper. You have pencil, so you can erase it if you're wrong. Take a guess at what you think is going on here. Yeah, I don't want to. Yeah, but it's so weird. Now, before you guys sketch the, you, you've sketched it already, Brian, in paper, but I'll, I'll show you to draw this very easily. It's a simple way to do it. But it does look tough to draw, and it does look kind of weird, right? And you'll notice on your graph. Now, the idea here is this. The function is increasing, increasing, increasing. And then it starts to flatten out, right? And then what happens? <laughs> it continues to increase. Again, you see what's going on there? The function is increasing the whole time. If I track this with my marker, it's increasing. The values are getting higher. They're flattening out. Now they're flat, pretty much. And then what happens again? They start to rise again. So here, what happens when... It, 
If somebody, okay, imagine your teacher stood like this and took, don't name teachers, anybody. <laughs> stood like this and just talked like this the whole period and didn't move and didn't change their voice. What would you do, right? You <laughs> probably know your hair. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, what do you call it? What do you call it when you change the pitch or the decibel level, you know, the sound of your voice? What is it called? What are you doing to your voice? Who knows the word for that? English word. Tone, okay. Tone. But you change the what of your voice. It could be pitch. Pitch is a word for it. Sure, that is one way to think about it for the frequency. Depth, okay. Bass, treble, those things are good. But there's a specific word when it comes to public speaking that people talk about all the time. What's with I? I? I thought you've heard this before. Inflection? No. 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 Okay, so, if you change the inflection in your voice, it's like you're going to cry it's too loud real quick. You're changing that inflection. It constantly moves the pitch of your sound. So here, we call this, relax guys, we call this point here, we call that point there where it's like a flat line there, the inflection point. <laughs> this guy's this word, you're using pre-calc, you're using calculus, you're using calc 2, calc 3, everything. You need to know this. Okay? Later on, they call it a stagnation point or a saddle horse in three dimensions. Oh, I get it. A saddle horse? Yeah, 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 three dimensions is a saddle horse. Because the bottom looks like the leg and the top looks like the leg. And if you had a third dimension on the other side, it would look like a horse and the saddle comes up like this and then down the other side. I can't draw that three dimensionally, sorry. So, when you draw this, here's what you want to do. In case you're having trouble, here's my suggestion for you. If you're having trouble, draw this. All you got to do is this. First, start by locating where it actually crosses. And on this one, it actually crosses at x equals 1. Okay, and how can you check that? Put it in a what? Put it in a what? <laughs> Put it in a synthetic table, please. So if we check this, before we graph it, let's run it through. That's what you get when you say, well, Jason. What did you say? Nothing. Knock it off. <laughs> like you do to everybody, every single day. I don't know if I'm You find every race, every creed. Every now, race. what you notice is this, guys. You get a what repeater root? How many? Two. Three. Three. One. Two. Three. Three. Oh, oh, count. Count. <laughs> All right, one, 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 guys. Notice. Notice. I said it wrong the second time I realized it. Notice there is a triple repeated root here. Triple repeated root. Okay? Triple repeated root. Now, earlier we talked about even amounts of repeated root. So double repeated, quadruple repeated. 6 repeated, 8 repeated, 10 repeated. Here it's triple. 3 is what kind of a number, guys? Odd. Odd. So maybe we'll make a generalization Odd. here. Okay? So a triple repeated root, or just generally speaking, any odd repeated root, if you have an odd amount. So if you have, for example, if you have the root 2 five different times, you have an inflection point. If you have the root 7, nine different times, or an odd amount of times. You have the root seven, nine times. You have an inflection point at seven. So our generalization is that an odd amount of repeated roots yields an inflection point. Now, in order to graph this, all you want to do is this. Start by drawing like a parabola. So start, and again, this one goes through negative one. There's my y-intercept. So start by drawing what you think would be a parabola. And you would normally come back around, right? Again, a parabola you would come back around and it would be that would be tangent. But now draw the other half of the parabola up like that. So again, think about it this way. Split it down the middle in your mind. Think about the lower half as a parabola with a neg negative a. Think about the upper half as a parabola with a positive a. Again, that's negative a. 
Okay, and we call this in science and math later on concavity. Remember concave, concave or convex lenses? Oh, yeah. This is concave down. This is concave up. See how the curve? See how the curve kind of points up here, and the curve here kind of points down. Okay, think. Look at my hand. If I, if I were to continue this, that would aim. Stop. This would aim down. This one here would aim up. Okay, so this top part would be concave up. This would be concave down. It's so important that you understand these words, guys. Again, this is concave down. Please write this down. This is concave up. And just think about it this way. If you continued the graph, this would aim down, wouldn't it? So it's concave down. If you continue the upper half of the graph, that would aim up. So that would be concave up the whole way. Again, think about a bucket aiming up, or up is in a smile, down is in a frown. Okay? Concave up is something that always the curvature points upward. Another way to think about it is this. If you had to continue this and make like a circle, which way would the radius go? Well, if you kind of made a circle out of this like this, right? Wouldn't the radius kind of point upward? Okay, or if you started right at the inflection point, wouldn't the radius point upward? If you continue to circle down here, I know it's not really a circle, the radius would point downward for this one. So it's like concave down, okay? It's, it's extremely important, I'm telling you now. I never go over this in algebra two. I started doing, I'm starting it this year. Because you use it next year in pre-calc, and you use it in calculus. So by the time you get to calculus, this should be second nature. Okay? And for some of the students in Calc right now, that concept is still confusing, believe it or not. Okay, I know to you right now it seems very simple, but some people are still confused about what concavity is. This is concave down, this is concave up. Concavity exists when you have an inflection point. I mean, it I'm sorry, it always exists. A change in concavity. Going from concave down to concave up, that's when you have an inflection point. Hold on, Jason, one sec. In the last graph, look at this one. This was not an inflection point. What point was this? Luis, thank you. Guys, come on, listen. Stop talking now. Below your breath. That's a tangent right there. Now, this one aims which way? Concave? Oh. Up. The whole way. There's no down concavity. I mean, maybe like right here. Do you see that right there? That little curvature kind of points down right there. That's it. You see that? Very little bit. Everything else would be up. Then this would be down for a little while. Then everything else would be voicing, uh, facing upward. Okay? All these are facing upward. There might be a little portion that's concave down. But again, if you have something like a parabola, a parabola is always one concavity, either down or up. Remember, this is when A is positive. This is when the leading coefficient was negative also. These are just good things to correlate. Okay? You're making connections between concepts 25 and such with concepts 36 or 35 today. Trayvon, and then Jason. So quick, there's only, uh, there's only a change in the uh, concave. Concavity. Concave. When there's an inflection point. So whenever you have a change in concavity, Trayvon, ever, you want to write this down, everybody. Whenever you have a change in concavity, there's an inflection point there. So an inflection point creates a change in concavity. So the converse is true. Remember last year we did converse and inverse with, with conditional statements. If you have an inflection point, then you have a change in concavity. If you have a change in concavity, then you have an inflection point. Remember the converse, P implies Q, as opposed to Q implies P. So if you want to write that. If change in concavity, I'm using delta for change, then we have an inflection point. Notice the shorthand, guys. Okay? If there's a change in concavity, then we have an inflection point. We also know that if we call this P implies Q, well, Q implies P is also true. The converse is true from last year. We did this last year. Are you good? If we have an inflection point, remember, if-then statements. If we have an inflection point, then we have a change in concavity. Remember, the arrow means then. The arrow means then. Okay? If P, then Q. Both of these are true statements. Okay? This is one of the rare examples that that exists. Remember, the, con the converse of any statement is not always true. Converse of any statement is not always true. Can somebody think of one? Converse of think of a statement, remember from last year, where the converse wouldn't be true. <laughs> think, come on. Oh, like Guys, think, think. You need this stuff for calculus. You use it all. Come up with a statement, if then, such that when I reverse the order of the conditionals, when I reverse that, it is not true. Oh, I got one. No, there's nothing bad with it. Jason. Oh, Jason. 
Very good. Exactly. Okay, so what was the dog type you used? Poodles. All poodles are dogs. Agree. But are all dogs poodles? No. The converse is not true there. It is extremely important, guys, that you understand converse and inverse from last year. You're going to use it again in calculus and in pre -calculus. <laughs> there was a general pattern that was true, false, false, true for conditional statement, converse, inverse, not positive for general statements. But there are exceptions, clearly. Just like the exception with the perpendicularity. If two lines are perpendicular, they form a right angle. If there's a right angle, then the two lines are. That's also an example where the converse is true. We call that a biconditional statement. Remember last year. If the converse is true and the initial statement is also true, this is called a biconditional. Because either condition works. Bi meaning both. Either condition works. Condition. Okay, and we wrote it this way last year. Okay, P implies Q or Q implies P. Again, it's a review from last year. I know that. Now, let's get back to summarizing today. Okay, so that's inflection point. So if we have an even amount, so repeated roots, we'll make a column for it. If we have an even amount, we're going to draw an image of it, and then we're going to write a description. So the image would look like what again? What's the sheet? Even amount gives you a what? Oh, uh, tangent, thank you. Please draw yourself a tangent somewhere. Okay, and this is the Im this is the image where it's even amount repeated. And again, the description is a tangent. Odd. Very good. Inflection point. Why, thanks, John. <laughs> okay. Oh, description. <laughs> I'm sorry. But we love this class this year. It's fun. So, at this location, at this location, we have an inflection point. And you can tell because you can see the change in concavity. It's concave down here in the beginning, and then it starts to point up, and then it comes to point down again. So, there's three changes in concavity. There's really in case you're wondering, this one does not matter to us right now. But there really is another inflection point right here. It's not on the axis, but take a look. This would be concave down, concave up, and then that's concave down again. Well, if you have a change in concavity, there must be an inflection point. That would be the inflection point there. But the red one doesn't matter for now. We're talking about inflection points that occur from repeated roots. So we're not looking at this one because that's not a root. So again, it's just a side note. You don't have to know that for this. Okay? Again, what you're focusing on is the root right here at around negative 2. Okay? And again, this is an inflection point. Okay, this is pretty much the whole lesson right here, guys. Okay? After a while, it will be easy. Try your homework tonight. It'll be very easy. You'll take a look at a few graphs, take a look at sketches, and see. Now, who can summarize imaginary? Because I know we did that last class and before, but just to summarize in the table real quick. Just for imaginary. Imaginary. Give me some facts about imaginary roots. How do they appear? They don't exist. They don't exist. What does that mean? I express as I. Okay, they express. Uh, express. Not a number line. Thank you. On the genre graphic. Oh. Uh, you're, you're right. They are. They don't exist. They have an eye, but graph. Oh. So again, they don't show up on the graph. They don't show up in the graph, so they do not appear as x-intercepts. Again, they don't show up in the graph. That's one thing. Next, they come in pairs. Thank you, Anthony. Very good. They come in pairs. Again, because of the quadratic formula, that's the reason. Plus or minus. That is the reason right there. Now, if you want to draw a quick image of what something that would look like would be, Okay, this graph here would have one, and then it might have two or three. So it might, I'm sorry, it might have two more uh, imaginary roots. So we'll say this is like x to the third. Okay, there's one root. Well, where's the other two roots? They're all somewhere up here floating around. They're imaginary. Okay, again, there's one of my roots right there, like negative three. Well, where's the other two roots? Because this is x to the third. The other two roots are imaginary. So here we'd have two imaginary. Now, if it was x to the fifth, if it was x to the fifth, how many imaginary would you have? 
4 imaginary. Again, if it was x to the fifth, you would have 4 imaginary. Again, because one of the roots is right here, well, where's the other 4? Because it's to the fifth. There's 4 imaginary. Okay? Your homework tonight is a worksheet. Sorry it didn't go as fast as I'd like, but I did add a lot of stuff that I did not cover last year. Okay? And it's important to note these things. When I tell you that, you know, you're not going to be assessed on it, that's fine. But please write this stuff down. Because all your stuff from this year, you're going to use in pre-count next year. Save everything we do. I'm not exaggerating when I say this. Everything we touch upon, you will go into more detail on next year. Everything you work on in pre-count, you're going to use in calculus. Save your books, please. Okay? Yes? So we're not going to do stuff. I don't think so. I can talk to you about it. Can we talk about it tomorrow? If I have more time? No, there are still more programs that that give us. But it doesn't look good. Just to give you a heads up, of course, I can go into more detail tomorrow. I'm happy to do it. I know. I know. And I've, I've been trying to finalize the decision. So I'll talk to you tomorrow. Let me just talk to a few people first, okay? Again, your worksheet tonight. You have four questions. We have to answer in words. And the last ones, you answer with actual graphing, please. You need a calculator. People, if you don't have a calculator, I recommend this website. Write this down. It's even better than Jojo Bro. Is that your brother? No, it's not my brother. It's a math lecture. Go to this website. So write it down, please. <laughs> Wolfram Alpha. Write this down. Write the whole word down. Dot com. WolframAlpha.com. Type in the function right there. It'll make very nice graphs for you automatically. It'll tell you what the roots are. It goes through all the details. Any mins and maxes, vertical uh, symmetry, all that stuff. Okay, it does all this kind of stuff for you. It's a good resource to check your work with.